Chapter 5 Marianne was there within the hour, and Esther got to meet Samuel for the first time. She was surprised at the strong resemblance between the brothers. Samuel and Thomas were identical, except Samuel's hair had a light dusting of gray. Marianne asked no questions and simply started to work on the dishes. Esther introduced herself, but Marianne just nodded shyly. Thank you for doing the dishes for me. Marianne nodded. Ma said I couldn't do anything else till the dishes were done. Samuel watched as his daughter went to work and then turned to the door. Victoria will be here for her in a week. He clapped a hand to his brother's shoulder. Take care of my girl. Thomas nodded. You know I will. It was late by the time the dishes were finished. Esther was thrilled for the help, but it was hard for her to sit and watch the dishes being done in her home without jumping up to help. She wasn't used to sitting idle while others worked around her. When they were settled into bed that night, Thomas pulled her into his arms and held her. I'm glad the baby is okay. Esther nodded. I was so scared. She'd been certain she was going to lose the baby that afternoon, and she couldn't bear the thought of losing the last piece of her first husband. I'm going to buy a dinner bell that you can ring if you need me. You won't be able to hear it everywhere on the land, so there's no point. I'll be okay. She didn't want him to waste money on something so frivolous when it wouldn't necessarily solve their problems anyway. He sighed. You're probably right, but I'm going to be afraid to leave you now. Marianne will be here for at least a week. She can come and get you if anything goes wrong. She knew it was a temporary solution, but he should be calmer about her health and the health of the baby within a week. She hoped he would at least. He ran his hand down her back, wishing they could do more than just lie together in bed. I know. After she's gone, it's going to be harder, though. Esther smiled. You know I've lived alone for most of my pregnancy with no one to check on me, right? He shrugged. You weren't my wife then. She smiled, closing her eyes. He may not be Charlie, she thought, but he sure does care about this baby. She knew then she'd made the right decision when she married him. She fell asleep with a smile on her face. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Esther woke up and stretched, noting that the other side of the bed was empty. She hurried and got up to go down and fix breakfast. When she reached the bottom of the stairs she found Marianne had already fixed bacon, eggs and toast. She took her place at the table while Marianne served them. Your ma said I could do the cooking, she protested. Marianne shrugged. She told me the less you did, the better. She sat down and folded her hands, waiting for her uncle to pray for them. Esther bowed her head, thankful for the sweet girl who was working so hard for her. She was only ten, but she certainly knew her way around a kitchen and knew how to clean. When Thomas left for the fields he told her where he'd be, and made her promise to be careful. She spent most of the first day of Marianne's visit sitting in her rocker working on the baby's blanket. Marianne spoke little, which Esther was learning seemed to be a family trait, but she worked hard. She cleaned the upstairs bedrooms and cooked every meal. Every time Esther suggested she get up and help, Marianne would tell her she could do it and ask her to sit back down. Esther wasn't sure how long she could handle sitting and doing nothing but knitting, but she would do her best. Marianne fixed a simple supper of beans and cornbread, but Esther was so hungry she ate every bite and got seconds. Thomas watched her eat with a smile. I'm so happy to see you have an appetite now. I am too. The queasiness is finally gone and I feel like a new woman. She was so happy to be able to eat again, she was ready to dance. Of course, everyone would just tell her to sit down again. Has the bleeding stopped? Esther nodded. It has. I'm sure I could work again. There's no need for me to sit around doing nothing. Marianne looked at Esther. Mama said you'd say that. She said to tell you if you wanted to have a baby in six months, you needed to take it easy now. She spooned up another bite of the beans as she watched Esther. 
Esther made a face. I guess tomorrow I'll start sewing clothes for the baby. I have nothing else to do. I could help you make a quilt for him, Marianne offered. Esther smiled. That would be nice. I'd love to have something to do with someone else. Sitting around watching you clean all the time is lonely work. Before she'd left Beckham, her mother had given her some scraps of fabric to use for a quilt for the baby, but she hadn't had time to do anything with them. She was happy she wouldn't be sewing by herself. When she'd married Charlie, she'd been alone most of the time, but it hadn't bothered her. Maybe because she knew she could walk to her parents' house whenever she wanted. Here, she felt isolated from the world. She needed to learn how to get to Samuel and Victoria's house so she could go visit whenever she wanted. The next day passed quickly as she and Marianne spent the entire day sewing together, other than quick breaks while Marianne cooked the meals. Esther was impressed with the girl's domestic skills and hoped that someday she'd have a daughter to teach how to cook and sew. She genuinely enjoyed the time she spent with her new niece. She was a lot more animated at dinner that night, still eating more than she'd eaten when she first arrived. It seemed as if her morning sickness was finally over and she had more energy as well. She was excited that she'd be able to do everything for herself again in a few days. By the time Victoria came at the end of the week, she felt as if she'd accomplished a great deal toward getting the house ready for a baby. She had several small outfits made, and two quilts, plus the small blanket she had finished the day Marianne was first there. Victoria examined her and smiled. You're as good as new. You can go back to doing anything you feel up to doing. Esther was relieved. She'd felt like she wasn't holding up her end of the bargain by not engaging in relations with Thomas. He hadn't said anything, but she'd known he wanted more from her than she was able to give. Victoria stayed for a while and visited after the exam. Marianne made them tea and cookies, and they munched on them while Victoria talked about the difficulties of living on a homestead. Where's the nearest town? I need more flour and sugar before the week is up. Esther hadn't seen any town between Lindsborg and the homestead. Victoria laughed. Remember the town where the train brought you? That's our closest town. Esther blinked. How can I get sugar and flour, then? Someone from the church goes into town at least once a week. We take turns. This week is our turn. Just make a list of what you need and I'll pick it up while I'm in town. I'll get all the letters for everyone as well. We go that often for mail more than for supplies. I haven't been to church yet. What's it like? Esther hadn't noticed a church in the area, but since she'd never left the homestead after her arrival, that wasn't surprising. We take turns having it in different homes. This week is your turn, come to think of it. There are only four families, so it's not a big deal. If you'd like, I can take your turn and you can take mine next week. Esther shook her head. You've done enough for me. I can handle it. Do I fix lunch for everyone afterward? She liked the idea of hosting a big group, but wasn't sure she was up to cooking for them all. No, everyone brings a dish and we all help clean up after the meal. Okay. I can handle that. Is there something special I provide as the host? Esther wanted to make a good impression on the other ladies who would be the only people she would see for months on end. No, not at all. Just fix enough for you and Thomas. Everyone fixes enough for their family to eat, and then we all share. I'll be sure to bring extra in case you don't feel up to cooking. You'll provide coffee and any other drinks. I'm fine. I've felt up to cooking for days, but Marianne wouldn't let me. Victoria smiled at her daughter fondly. She was following orders and it sounds like she did a good job. She stood up. If you'll get that list ready for me, I'll go ahead and go. I need to get dinner ready for my family. Esther quickly wrote a list on a slip of paper and handed it to Victoria. She'd enjoyed Marianne's company but would be happy to have her home to herself again. Thanks for getting it for me. It's no problem. It'll be your turn soon enough. 
I should feel up to it soon. Esther stood at the door as she watched them go, missing Marianne already. She went to the kitchen and fixed a light meal, whipping up a cake to go with it. She discovered that Thomas hadn't exaggerated his love of sweets, and she was happy to keep him content with his favorite foods. When Thomas came in from the fields for dinner and saw Esther standing at the work table frosting a cake, his heart jumped. She was really better. He walked up behind her and wrapped his arms around her waist. I'm glad you're doing better. She turned to him and smiled, a little startled by the open display of affection. I'm just glad the baby's okay. I haven't met the baby yet. You're the one I was worried about. I made you a cake. I see that. Thank you. He dropped a quick kiss on her lips. I'm glad you felt up to it. I've been cleared for all activities, she told him with a slight blush. He shook his head. I'm not risking the baby. I can wait until after he's born. No, there's no need. Victoria said it was fine. He shrugged. I'm still waiting. I'm not going to put you or our baby at risk. She blinked at his use of the word R with regard to the baby. Did he really think of the baby as his own? I appreciate that, but there's really no need to worry about it. Why was she arguing with him? Did she want to have relations? Sit down. I'll have supper on the table in a minute. He sat down at his regular place and she put his plate in front of him. He took her hand and held it tightly while he prayed for them, thanking God for keeping the baby safe and praying that Esther's pregnancy would continue to be a safe one. After the dishes were done that evening, she took the things she and Marianne had made and put them away in the nursery. She was thankful for the time she'd had to work on them, but wished she had been able to keep up with her other chores at the same time. Thomas went looking for her and found her in the nursery, lovingly stroking the quilt she'd made. Are you sleeping in here? he asked surprised. She shook her head. No, I'm sleeping with my husband. Just putting the baby's things away. She picked up the lantern from the dresser and carried it into the bedroom they shared. She'd only slept in the nursery the first night she was there, and she was surprised he'd think she wanted to sleep there again. She blew out the lantern, undressed, and pulled her nightgown over her head, climbing into bed beside him. She immediately slipped into his arms, where she'd slept for the past week. When he gave her a quick kiss and pulled away, she followed him, kissing him again and letting him know she'd be amenable to making love with him. He pulled back. I don't want to hurt you. You won't hurt me. Victoria said everything was fine. He shook his head. I'm not risking it. He held her close as he closed his eyes and fell swiftly to sleep. She lay beside him, annoyed at his attitude. She'd offered to make love with him and he wasn't interested? What kind of marriage was she in? She rolled to her side of the bed, making sure there was room between them. If he didn't want to touch her, then she didn't want to touch him. There were tears on her pillow when she finally fell asleep. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. As the week wore on, Esther felt like she and Thomas were growing further and further apart. He'd kiss her and hug her as long as they weren't in bed together, but as soon as they slipped between the sheets, he'd give her one quick kiss and tell her good night. She couldn't understand why he was being so distant from her. They knew it was okay to make love, so why wouldn't he touch her? Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Thomas stood in the field staring off into space. He should have been weeding his wheat field, but he was going crazy instead. Every time he closed his eyes, he'd see his beautiful willing wife. Every night, he pretended to fall asleep so she'd move away from him. He stared up at the ceiling almost all night long burning with frustration. Something had to give. She made it very clear she was willing, pressing herself against him and kissing him. But it wouldn't be right for him to risk the baby. He thought about riding over to talk to Samuel, but he didn't think his brother would want to hear his complaints. He had to figure out what to do. He wouldn't risk his wife, but he was about to burn up with sexual frustration. 
Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Esther was nervous. Church services would be held at their house that week, and her house wasn't perfect. Every time she washed the windows, a bug would land on them and mess them up and she'd have to wash them all over again. She'd made chicken and dumplings and a cake for dessert to share with the others, but what if no one liked her cooking? She felt like a failure. Her house wasn't perfect, and it should be. And her own husband didn't want to touch her. Would she ever be good enough at anything? That evening when Thomas walked in the door for supper, she was sitting at the table crying. He rushed to her side. Is it the baby? Are you bleeding again? The panic emanating from him was almost something she could touch. She shook her head and cried all the harder. What's wrong then? Bugs keep flying into my clean windows, and you don't want to touch me, she sobbed. What do bugs have to do with anything? And of course I want to touch you. He pulled her to her feet and held her close. Tell me what's happening with the bugs first. She sniffled. I keep washing the windows and then bugs fly into them. It's making me crazy. I don't know how to make them stop, but the windows have to be perfect for when everyone comes for church service in the morning. Why do they have to be perfect? She stared at him in disbelief. Did he really not understand? This is my only chance to make a good first impression on the ladies in the church. If the house is a mess, I won't make a good first impression. She swiped at the tears under her eyes, stunned for a moment that he wouldn't understand immediately. You think you'll make a bad impression if bugs make marks on the windows? She nodded. Of course I will. He sighed. All the ladies who go to church with us live in this part of Kansas as well. They know that the bugs fly into the windows because it happens at their houses. No one can get rid of them. It's just a fact of life here. They have bug prints on their windows. She swiped away the tears with her apron. I've never noticed, but I'm sure they do. There's no way not to have bug prints on windows in Kansas. He stroked her hair. Now, what's this about me not wanting to touch you? She felt the tears spring to her eyes all over again. You never try to touch me anymore. When we first got married, I thought you were interested in me physically, but now you never touch me. I don't touch you because I'm afraid I'll hurt you or the baby if I do. The only time we had relations, the next day you started bleeding. She shook her head. That's not why. Why did it happen then? Because I was running through the fields looking for you when I couldn't find you. I thought you were dead, and I ran and I shouldn't have. Why do you think that's why you were bleeding? Because Victoria said that's probably what caused it. She said she'd seen it happen before that women did too much physical stuff and it caused them to start bleeding. It's not a big deal, and I should just be careful not to run anymore. Why didn't you tell me? You didn't ask. He sighed. If that's really why you were bleeding, then of course I want to make love to you. Really? He nodded. I've been lying awake half the night trying to make myself forget you were lying beside me. His hands roamed down and cupped her bottom. So tonight you'll make love to me? He swallowed hard. Yes, I will. If you're sure it won't hurt you. I'm sure. She looked over at the window. Are you sure you can't see the bug spots and no one will judge me because my windows aren't shiny? He laughed. As long as the dishes are done, no one will say a word. They all know you're a new wife and you're pregnant. She blinked. Everyone knows I'm pregnant? Victoria told everyone last week why we weren't there. Does that bother you? She shook her head, but looked down. I guess not. Why would it bother you? You were married. You told me you were pregnant. I still wanted you to come. It's not like you hid it from me. She sighed. I just feel like I've done something wrong, is all. I wish everyone thought the baby was yours. The baby is mine now. I'm its father the same as I'm your husband. 
he'll never know any other man as his father. Will you tell him he's not really yours? He shrugged. I'll leave that up to you. If you want him to know about his real father, then you have the right to tell him. If you want him to think I'm his father, that's fine too. Either way, I'll be his father. She nodded, not sure how she'd handle things, but glad he had the attitude he did. She wanted the baby to think of him as a father, but she didn't know if she wanted to have Charlie's baby not know all about him. She'd have to think about it. When they finally went upstairs for the night, Thomas hesitated before undressing. Are you sure this isn't going to hurt you or the baby? She sighed. I'm sure. Victoria told me it was fine. You were the one who said she was a good midwife. Do you want me to see someone else? Why was he trying to avoid having relations with her? Thomas looked at her for a moment. I think I do. There's a doctor in Lindsborg. I'll take you there Monday, and we'll see what he says. She stared at him in disbelief. Are you serious? I thought you said you trusted Victoria. I do. I just don't want to risk you. Esther turned her back to him and turned down the wick on the lantern to shut it off. She was too scared to speak. Was he no longer interested in having sex with her? She pulled her nightgown over her head and crawled between the covers. She couldn't change his mind, obviously, so she stopped trying. She rolled to her side with her back to him and fell asleep, not bothering to kiss him goodnight. Thomas stared at his wife in the dark. Why was she so angry with him? He sighed. Hopefully the doctor would say everything was fine on Monday. Chapter 6 Esther stood wringing her hands the following morning as they waited for the other families in the area to show up for church services. She'd never hosted anything like this before, having always attended an established church when she lived in Beckham. It was 15 minutes before services started, and everything was as clean as she could possibly make it. She'd done the breakfast dishes and her hair was in a tight bun atop her head. When she heard the first wagon pull into the yard she rushed out to stand on the porch and greet whomever had arrived first. She was relieved to see it was Victoria and her family. At least she knew two of the people getting out of the wagon and walking toward her house. She introduced herself to Thomas's brother and smiled at Victoria and Marianne. Will you make sure I have everything set up right? She asked Victoria. Of course. Did Thomas tell you every family brings their own chairs? No one has enough for all of us. Thomas is the only one in the area without children, so we have a group of about 20 meeting here. Thomas and Samuel were unloading chairs from the back of their wagon and carrying them into the house. I made chicken and dumplings and a cake for lunch. Will that be okay? Victoria nodded. That's perfect. We don't usually have desserts, so I'm sure the children will swarm around you. Esther immediately worried she hadn't made enough cake. She'd made one large enough for a big group, but 20 people? She'd never cooked for that many at once. I hope I made enough. Victoria shrugged. Everyone can have smaller pieces if you didn't. Most likely the adults will forego dessert to let the children have a bigger share. It doesn't matter. I just want everything to be perfect. Victoria smiled at Esther. You need to learn that living on the prairie like this means that nothing is ever perfect. We're too far from the nearest mercantile to run out for the last minute things we've forgotten. There are too many bugs for everything to be spotless. Just relax. Everyone is going to love you. Esther nodded, not believing a word her new sister-in-law was telling her. How could she relax? She had a large group of people she'd never met arriving at her home any minute, and she could see a lot of new marks on the windows where the bugs had flown into them. Another wagon pulled into the yard, and a couple in their thirties climbed out with their six children jumping down from the back of the wagon. The smallest of the children ran up to Esther, staring at her. Esther had been around children her entire life, having been the oldest of eight. She picked up the little girl. I'm Esther. Who are you? 
The little girl had been sucking on her first two fingers and popped them out of her mouth to answer. Bulia. Bulia. Esther looked at Victoria for confirmation. This is Julia Anderson. Her parents are Mary and Anthony. Mary walked over and stood, smiling at Esther. You must be Esther. We heard a lot about you at service last week. Esther smiled. I hope you heard good things? Absolutely. How are you feeling now? Better? Esther blushed and nodded. She really hated that everyone here knew she was carrying. It would have been so much easier if everyone had thought the baby was Thomas's. Much better thanks to Victoria and Marianne. Victoria held her arms out for Julia who immediately jumped into them. I don't want you lifting anything as heavy as this little one. Esther sighed. So if I am carrying another in two years, I won't be able to lift the one I'm carrying now? That's right. Children adjust. A third wagon pulled into the yard then. Victoria pointed out the adults in the wagon. This is Andrew and his wife Bertha. They have four children and Bertha is carrying their fifth. Esther's eyes lit up. She liked the idea of her child having another so close who would be around the same age. Bertha carefully got down from the wagon and walked to join the other women. She looked to be in her fifth month. Esther held her hand out in greeting. I'm Esther. Bertha smiled. Bertha. I hear you're carrying too. How far along are you? Just about three months. What about you? The same. Esther's eyes grew wide. The other woman looked much bigger than she did. Really? Bertha laughed. You tend to show much faster after the first pregnancy. Esther nodded apprehensively. Would she look that big when she was just three months with her second child? The men called from the doorway for the women to join them inside. Esther followed along and saw that her table, which she had meticulously arranged, was pushed against one wall, and the things on it were tipped over. She bit her lip against the tears that threatened. She'd so wanted to make a good impression, and her vase of flowers was scattered all across the table. The chairs were lined up in rows, and each family took a row. Esther sat in the back with Thomas. Samuel stood in front of the room with his Bible in his hand. Esther was surprised, because she'd understood from Marianne that he was a farmer like Thomas, and he was very shy. She wasn't sure why he was the preacher for the church. They began the service by standing and singing a hymn. It was one Esther had sung many times, so she was familiar with it. Her clear soprano voice sang out loudly. After the prayer they took their seats while Samuel opened his Bible and began to preach. Esther had been unsure what to expect, but it certainly wasn't what happened next. Instead of a true sermon, they had what she would call a Bible group. Samuel would read a passage, and then everyone would discuss the passage. It was really little more than controlled chaos with the small children calling out random answers whenever they were given the chance. Esther had never been to a casual service, so she was surprised it was done that way. After they prayed and sang a second song, the men went outside to talk and supervise the children while the women hurried to put lunch on the table. Esther found she liked the idea of eating with the women who would be her friends and fellow church members, because she wanted to get to know them all better. Once the food was on the table, they called the men in and prayed again. The men and children sat in the chairs the other families had brought, while Esther and the women sat at the table. Does Samuel always do the preaching? Esther asked. Victoria nodded. He's the oldest, so all the others voted that he has to do it. He always teaches like he did today, though. He's not a qualified preacher and refuses to do anything but discuss his views and the views of the others. It was strange, Esther blurted out. The other women all laughed. It's been a work in progress, Mary told her. At first the men took turns trying to preach actual sermons and that was awful. None of them felt comfortable doing it, and nothing they preached made very much sense. Esther grinned. 
I can't imagine Thomas preaching. Bertha shook her head. He wasn't the worst. They were all really bad to be honest with you. Then they decided to take turns just reading from the scriptures. The children squirmed and wiggled, and we women got sick of that pretty fast, too. Then about six months ago, the men decided to try it this way. It seems to work better than anything else we've done. Mary shrugged as if she was hopeful it would continue to work. I guess there are no preachers in the area? Victoria shook her head. There just aren't enough people here to warrant sending a pastor. We enjoy the way we do it, but it's definitely different. I like the lunches afterward. Mary nodded emphatically. We all get a little bit of Bible learning, but the important thing is we get to fellowship with each other. We all need that more than anything. Especially since there are no schools or anything else. Esther made a face. Do any of you ever go a little bit crazy wishing there were more people around? Victoria laughed. When we first moved here, it was just us and Thomas. I looked at my husband, his brother, my two little ones, and wheat fields for months on end. I really thought I was going to end up in an asylum. I was so happy to see Mary when she first moved here that I think I spent every other day at her place. She didn't even have a house yet, so I'd take her bread or coffee or anything I could think of just to have the company of another woman. Esther smiled slightly. I think I'd have been the same way. Bertha nodded. I would have too. I'm thankful the others were already here when I arrived. She squeezed Esther's hand. It's even harder to be out here when you're carrying, so if you start to go crazy, you come see me. Or any of the others, of course. Esther nodded. Thank you. I'm doing okay, so far, but I had Marianne with me for most of the week, which really helped out a lot. You really haven't been here long enough to go crazy yet. Winter is the worst. When the snow starts to fly, you'll find you want to get out and won't feel like you should, especially with a baby on the way. Everything you want to do will have to wait. You'll have to buy all the supplies you'll need for the whole winter and the fall. I don't know what we'd do if we didn't have Victoria. Bertha smiled at Victoria. She's not only our midwife, she takes care of us when anything goes wrong. Esther looked at Victoria with surprise. You handle all of the doctoring for the area? Only the minor things. Broken bones, stitching up cuts, and that type of thing. For anything big, you have to drive to the city. I had no idea. I thought you were only the midwife. Esther felt new respect for the woman who had cared for her. Once they were finished eating, the four women did the dishes together while the men watched the children outside. From her vantage point at the sink, Esther could see Thomas playing with his nephews and nieces. He had Victoria's youngest, Laura, on his shoulders, running around in circles with her while she giggled. She could easily see Thomas with their children and sighed with relief. She hadn't been certain he was anxious to be a father, but watching him with his nieces and nephews, it was obvious he was good with children. After the meal, she asked to speak with Victoria alone. She didn't want to be rude to the others, but she wanted to make certain that everything was all right. They climbed the stairs to the bedroom she shared with Thomas, and she perched on the edge of the bed. Are you sure I'm okay, to return to all activities? Victoria eyed her. I'm certain. I don't want you to lift anything heavy, but other than that, I think you can do whatever you want. Anything? What are you trying to ask me, Esther? Esther sighed. I guess I just need to come right out and say it. Thomas is afraid to have relations because he's afraid it will hurt the baby. I told him you said it was okay, but he's insisting on taking me to a doctor in the city tomorrow just to be certain. Victoria smiled. Thomas loves children. He's not going to do anything to jeopardize the baby you're carrying. But he won't hurt us. Sexual relations are new to Thomas. I'm sure that he's afraid he's going to break you if you do anything. Go to the doctor and let him confirm what I've been telling you. It won't hurt a thing. 
I just don't want to have to waste a full day and pay a doctor when I already know it's okay for me to do what I want. Esther shook her head, her exasperation showing in her stance. Victoria shook her head. Thomas needs to understand that as well. Samuel was really worried when I carried Marianne. After she was born and fine, he wasn't nearly as worried. He wouldn't touch me during the entire pregnancy. When she was born fine, he decided he was a little too strict with himself. So I may have to wait until after the baby's born? Esther realized she sounded like a petulant child, but she'd really enjoyed relations and didn't want to have to go for the next seven months without. Surely Thomas would be able to see she was fine and he was being too careful. Humor him and see the doctor. If it makes him feel better it's worth it, right? Esther nodded slowly. I guess. Victoria hugged her. Let's go join the others. When they got downstairs, Esther saw that the other two families were leaving. She'd hoped they'd spend the day, but apparently no one ever stayed long after the noon meal. Will you stay? she asked Victoria. Victoria nodded. Of course. Esther was thrilled to have the other family around and wished she'd waited to talk to Victoria until after the others had left. She'd have to make a point of visiting both of the other women and letting them know how happy she was to have them around. After Samuel's family left that evening, Esther fixed a cold supper for her and Thomas. After the prayer, he said, we'll start early in the morning for the city, as soon as the cows are milked and the breakfast dishes are done. Esther nodded. If you think that's best. I'll feel better after you've seen a real doctor. I know Victoria learned a lot about doctoring from her pa, but she never went to school for it. I'd rather you saw a doctor who's been to medical school. Well, you feeling better is the main thing we're worried about, right? She couldn't keep the slight sarcastic tone from her voice. Did he think he was the one who was pregnant or something? He sighed. I know you think I'm being overly cautious, but I feel like God has entrusted me with a wonderful woman and a child who belongs to me and another man. I need to make sure both are safe. She nodded, looking down at her food so he wouldn't see her roll her eyes. Why did he think she was this delicate little thing? She'd been raised like every other farm girl. To work. Her mother had eight healthy children, the last two a set of twins born when she was forty. Esther had always taken after her mother. I'll be ready to leave in the morning. I just hope the movements of the wagon don't nauseate me. With those words she stood and started washing the dishes with water she'd heated before the meal. She heard his groan from behind her. I thought all that was over. She shrugged. It probably is, but I think part of the reason it's over is because I haven't had to go anywhere in a wagon or by train. She smiled as she stared out the window. I'm sure everything will be fine. Thomas stared at her back, wondering if she was just trying to make him crazy, or if she really was worried about getting sick again from the motion of the wagon. Should he risk the drive? He stood. I don't think we're going to make that drive after all. He put his hands on the back of her shoulders and rubbed them. We can't have you getting sick again so soon. You're just starting to eat again, and you're not strong enough to get that sick. She smiled and turned to him, pressing a kiss to his lips. Does that mean you're willing to have relations? He stepped back, shaking his head. Not at all. If you're not healthy enough to ride in a wagon for three hours to see a doctor, then there's no way you're healthy enough for lovemaking. He took a fig from a small bowl on the counter where she had placed them for guests to snack on throughout the day. He brought some home at the end of the day yesterday to surprise her. He loved the summer months because there was always some kind of ripe fruit growing wild on the homestead. She glared. I won't get sick going to the doctor. She folded her arms across her chest, seriously annoyed that he'd called her bluff. Then why did you say you would, he asked with a raised eyebrow. Because I really think we're wasting money by missing a day of work and driving all the way to town for a doctor's appointment. I think we should stay here and work. It's just not necessary. Thomas shrugged. 
you'll see a doctor, or sleep in the nursery until the baby is born. His face told her how serious he was about the subject. You're actually threatening to keep relations from me? Shouldn't it be the other way around? She was dumbfounded. Men didn't withhold lovemaking. Only women did that, right? He shrugged. I've never had them to get used to. You were married for six months. I think at this point they matter more to you than they do to me. He desperately hoped she wouldn't call his bluff. He had no desire to spend the next six months alone in bed, but he would rather than backing down. She turned her back on him and finished the last of the dishes, drying them and putting them away. Removing her apron, she walked up the stairs without saying another word. He watched her go with a smile. He was certain she'd take the trip into town the next day to see the doctor. He knew he was being difficult, but he didn't appreciate the way she'd tried to manipulate him. He read for an hour before climbing the stairs and going up to bed. She was in her nightgown, sleeping on her side, facing away from where he slept. He smiled with a bit of relief. She hadn't just decided to go to the nursery or she would have moved her things and herself in there. She was going to the doctor in the morning. He was thrilled. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Esther was still annoyed with Thomas for his ultimatum the following morning. Why was he being so stubborn about her seeing a doctor? She had breakfast ready when he came in from milking. She hated the idea of spending the entire day in the wagon. Hopefully there'd be no wait for the doctor, because if there was, she didn't know how she'd handle it. She just didn't feel like she needed to go. He dried the breakfast dishes for her to hurry things along. She sighed. Do I need to fix a picnic lunch for the drive? He shook his head. I thought we'd go to a restaurant in town. I'd planned on taking you to one after the wedding, but it took you so long to get ready, we needed to get home right away. I wouldn't have enjoyed it that day anyway. I was too sick. She turned to him and smiled for the first time all morning. I'll enjoy it today. She was actually a little excited knowing that would be part of the trip. Maybe they could get some yard goods while they were there as well. She needed to make a couple of dresses for herself that she could wear in her last months, and she wanted to start sewing for the baby. I've never been to a restaurant. He smiled. Really? I've been to this one only once. It's really good. She bit her lip, wondering if she could ask for the fabric. I'd also like to get some fabric while we're in town, if that's okay. I need dresses for my last months, and I should do some more sewing for the baby. He shook his head. We'll have to wait until after harvest for those things. I have enough money for the restaurant and the doctor, but not enough left over for fabric. She nodded, feeling guilty for even asking. She started to walk away, but stopped. Wait. I still have some of the money you sent for my trip out here. I ate so little I barely spent any of it. He smiled and nodded. That money was for you. If you have some left, I'll take you to the mercantile while we're there. She smiled, excited about the trip ahead of them now. Did you get a list from the others of what they needed? Thomas nodded. Yeah, it was our week to go anyway. I have a small stack of letters to mail and a list of things to purchase. She removed her apron and put on the bonnet that matched her dress. She thought about running upstairs to change into a nicer dress, but knew she'd be dirty and dusty by the time they reached town anyway. Town was so far that it would be an all-day event each time they went, which made it seem special. He went to hitch up the wagon while she used the outhouse. Being pregnant made it so much harder to wait when she needed to go. When she finished, she watched him with the horses. He was slender, so at first she had discounted the amount of muscle in his body. His arms were bulging as he harnessed the horses and got the wagon ready for their trip. She admired how hard he worked, and certainly felt more for him than she had the day she'd met him. Once the wagon was ready, she walked over beside him and he helped her up. She was half afraid some of the sickness would come back, 
but she wasn't going to admit that to him. They'd been traveling for about five minutes before she was able to relax and enjoy the scenery. I really was scared the ride would make me queasy, but it's not bothering me at all. He smiled. Good. I want us to be able to enjoy the day today. She scooted closer to him on the wagon seat, realizing their arms touching as they did was probably inappropriate in public, but she enjoyed being close to him, and they were married after all. Proprieties didn't seem to matter quite as much here as they had back east either. It was as if she were living in an entirely different world, instead of just across the country from her hometown. Why are there so few trees, she asked. He shrugged. I really don't know, but it makes for good farmland. It's no fun to have to clear stumps all the time to try to have enough land to grow a decent-sized crop. That makes sense. She sighed. When she was young she'd had a large treehouse. Her child would never see that. Where do you get lumber for houses here? You have to buy it, and it's really expensive. We got ours out east and I went back and drove them out. It took load after load. He shook his head. Most people in the area just build sod houses, but neither of us wanted to do that. It cost a lot of money, but I'm happy with my house. I shouldn't have done it, in retrospect, but I'm glad I have the comfort of my wood home. I understand. She didn't know how she'd have felt about living in a sod house, but she was sure she would have adjusted. She wasn't picky and could adapt to most things easily. It's a wonderful house. Much better than I expected when I agreed to marry a homesteader in Kansas. He grinned over at her, taking her hand in his. I'm glad you agreed to marry this homesteader. I am too. She rested her head on his shoulder for a moment. I think this is a good place to raise the baby, and you've gone out of your way to make me welcome. It's nice to have company and someone to cook for me, he said with a smile. She laughed. I'm sure it is. I don't know how you did it before. Did you meet up with other families during the week, or was it just you all the time except Sunday? He shrugged. It was usually just me. Sundays were always a bit of a relief because I'd get to hear voices other than my own. I'm glad I'm here with you, then. Yes, she still missed Beckham. She missed her parents and Charlie. She missed Harriet. But she was glad to be with a man who treated her well, and she was thrilled to be away from her mother-in-law. She'd been very afraid the crotchety old woman would have tried to take her baby from her, and that wasn't going to happen here. There was no way she'd even find out there was a baby from this distance. Their relationship was still awkward to her way of thinking, but it probably should be. When she'd married Charlie, she'd known him since they'd started school together. When she'd gotten off the train in Lindsborg it was with the understanding that she'd be sharing the same intimacies as she had with Charlie, but without getting to know her new husband first. How could the situation not be awkward? Esther appreciated all he'd done to make her feel wanted and loved. He'd really been good for her, accepting her and the baby without question. She hoped that Harriet would find someone who was just as good to her as Thomas. Thomas looked down at Esther, noting she was lost in thought. He loved to look at his pretty wife. It seemed so strange to him that she'd headed west as a mail-order bride instead of just finding a man in her hometown. Unless there were simply no men there, she would not have had a problem finding one. Her hair was a light brown and her eyes were a deep chocolate. Nothing else about her could be described as ordinary. Her waist was tiny, but her breasts were full, and her hips were wide. He hoped that meant childbirth would be easy for her. As she stared off at the scenery, he couldn't help but wonder what she was thinking about. Did she spend her time missing her first husband? Did she still cry over him? Or was she moving on and thinking of him as the man she loved now? He hoped that was the case, but he had no way of knowing. He knew she didn't love him yet, and he really didn't expect her to. How could he? She'd known him for two weeks, but she'd known Charlie her whole life. He had mixed feelings about Charlie. In a way, he was jealous of him. Sure, the man was dead, 
but he'd held Esther's heart during his life, and Thomas found he wanted Esther to love him the way she'd loved her late husband. He also felt as if he had an obligation to Charlie, as if it was his job to make sure that Esther and the baby were taken care of, because they didn't belong to him entirely. They also belonged to Charlie. It was strange, but it worked for him. He squeezed her hand. What are you thinking about? She shrugged. The woman who runs the mail order agency in Beckham. Harriet Long, right? Yeah. I never met her until a few days after Charlie died, even though we lived in the same town. At the time I met her, I walked into town every morning to sell my extra eggs so I would have a little money. After walking to the mercantile, I'd go to her house for tea. We spent hours and hours talking. She was so different from me, but we became such good friends. He nodded to encourage her to keep talking. How was she different? Harriet was a young widow, so somewhat like me, but she had some kind of secret. I think her ex-husband was mean to her, but I'm not sure. She never talked about him. She stared off into space as she talked about her friend. And she's rich. I'd never seen a home as fine as the one she lived in. If she was rich, why did she have a business? Did she need more money for some reason? Esther shrugged. I honestly never asked. We talked about a lot of things, but she didn't talk much about her life. She was a really private person. I really miss her. Have you written her? Esther's eyes widened. I haven't. I got so distracted once I was here. I'll have to write her a letter and send it while we're in town today. Is that a problem? He was confused. Was she required to write her for some reason? I promised her I'd write as soon as I got here because I didn't want her to worry about me. She wanted to kick herself. Write her today. I'm sure it will be fine. Esther nodded. I hope so. She's supposed to leave soon for her own wedding. She decided to be a mail-order bride as well. Esther realized then that she knew a lot about Harriet's plans for the future, but little about her present and nothing at all about her past. How odd. The drive passed pleasantly with her asking him questions about his upbringing in Kentucky. He and Samuel were the only boys and had four sisters. They decided to move west because of the offer of free land. Samuel had only been 16 when they left Kentucky, but they'd fibbed about his age when they went to file for his homestead. He'd been doing a man's work for two years and saw no need to wait until he was 21 to have his own land. He'd saved every dime he'd earned before heading to Kansas and had a significant amount to start his life with, which is how he'd been able to afford the lumber for his house. Weren't you scared? Leaving your parents at such a young age? He shrugged. Not really. I had Samuel and Victoria with me. The first night I ever spent alone was right here in Kansas on my very own land. It was an amazing feeling for me. He looked down at her. Was it hard for you to leave behind everything you knew and come out here? She laughed. I was petrified. I was even more nervous that my mother-in-law would try to take my baby from me, though. She was so angry with me for marrying her son. She looked off in the distance. I never told her I was pregnant, so she won't be looking for me. You don't have to worry about that. He stared at her in silence. Would she really try to take the baby? Esther nodded. She would. She loved my husband and would do anything to keep his child close to her. Your mother won't tell her, will she? No. My mother knows how much she hated me. He squeezed her hand. Look, off in the distance. Can you see it? She stared ahead of her and nodded slowly. What is that? That's where we're headed. It's Lindsborg. That's the town the train brought you to. He was excited that they were almost there. It looks different. That's probably because you don't have vomit on your eyelashes obscuring your vision now. He bit his cheek to keep from laughing as he said the words. 
she turned to him and sighed. I still can't figure out why you didn't send me right back to Beckham. How could you have married someone who was so disgusting? He shrugged. I'd made a promise to you and I wasn't going to go back on it just because you were sick. I did hope you'd be better looking after you got cleaned up, though. She grinned. And was I? I couldn't even tell you were the same person after the bath you took at the pastor's house. I'd never seen anyone so covered in vomit in my life. He didn't add that after she'd cleaned up he'd thought she was the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen. She stifled a giggle. She could just imagine how excited he was as he stood there waiting for his bride, and then he ended up with a girl who was covered with vomit from head to toe and smelled accordingly. The man was a saint for not leaving her right there at the train station. Within minutes of seeing the city, he'd pulled up in front of the doctor's house. I've never been here, but he's the only doctor in town. Victoria says he's good. She had to take one of the kids to him once. He held his hands up and lifted her down from the wagon. Usually he just held her hand to steady her, so she was surprised when he just gripped her waist and set her on the ground. I'm nervous, she told him, staring at the collar of his shirt. Why? She shrugged. I've only ever seen one doctor in my life, and he was the one who delivered me and buried my husband. Thomas squeezed her hand. I'll be right beside you. They walked to the office around the side of the doctor's home and Thomas knocked on the door. Within moments a man who looked to be in his sixties with stark white hair came to the door. May I help you? Thomas nodded. My wife is in the family way, and she had some bleeding. She saw a midwife, but I'll feel better if she's checked out by a doctor as well. The doctor opened the door wide. I'm Dr. Simmons. My sister-in-law says you're a good doctor. Do you know Victoria Wilson? The doctor's eyes widened. Yes, of course. She's a good midwife and very skilled with medicine herself. It's a shame women can't be doctors. She'd have made an excellent nurse, though. Esther followed Thomas inside the small examining room and waited to find out what she should do. Were there any activities that precipitated the bleeding? Dr. Simmons asked after waving them both to sit. Thomas nodded. We'd had relations the night before. Esther stared at him. Did he still think that caused it? I think the bleeding was caused when I ran through the fields. I was searching for my husband and starting to panic. Within a couple of hours, I realized I was bleeding. I see. Dr. Simmons looked between the two of them. If I had to make a guess, I would think it was caused by the running. He looked at Esther. I'll need to examine you. Why don't you get undressed while your husband and I talk for a moment? Thomas followed the doctor out of the room and stood with him outside the door. He was embarrassed by the subject, but he wasn't willing to do anything to hurt his new wife. You don't think it was the relations? The doctor shook his head emphatically. I'm of the opinion that relations are good for a woman who is expecting. How far along is she? Thomas shrugged. He should know that shouldn't he? I think about three months or a little more. So she's started her second trimester? At Thomas's nod, Dr. Simmons continued. Most women feel more inclined toward relations during their second trimester. I wouldn't be afraid of that if I were you. He turned toward the examining room door and knocked softly. Are you ready? Esther was lying on the bed under a sheet when Thomas peeked in. I'd rather you wait out here, Dr. Simmons said as he shut the door in his face. Thomas was left to pace the hall, wondering what was going on behind the closed door. He wished he could have been by her side for the exam, but it sounded as if it was going to be a very intimate exam. He wasn't sure how he felt about another man, even a doctor, seeing his wife without her clothes, though. Finally after several minutes had passed, the doctor opened the door and looked over his shoulder at Esther. Go ahead and get dressed. I'm going to spend a minute talking to your husband. He turned to Thomas. She's in perfect health. 
she said she had a hard time with morning sickness, but that's past. Thomas nodded. So she's okay? Dr. Simmons nodded emphatically. There's nothing wrong with her, other than being a little underweight, but that was caused by the morning sickness. She's going to be just fine. Thomas breathed a sigh of relief. And the baby? Baby seems to be fine as well. Victoria is as knowledgeable about childbirth as I am, if not more so. You didn't need to come all this way to see me. The doctor knocked on the door again. When Esther called out, he opened it. You're ready to go. Esther smiled and nodded at the doctor. Thank you. Thomas stuck his hand into his pocket for some money. How much do I owe you, Doc? Once they'd settled up, Thomas led Esther out of the office and into the fresh air. Feel better now? Esther asked with a grin. I do. He stroked his hand down her arm. Thank you for humoring me. This daddy thing is new to me, and I need to learn as I go. Esther laughed softly. I know. She looked around the small town, not nearly as big as Beckham. What now? Are you hungry, he asked. She grinned. I'm pregnant and couldn't eat for several weeks because of morning sickness. I'm ravenous. Chapter 7 They left the wagon where it was and walked the short distance to the restaurant. Esther was intimidated by the pristine linen tablecloths and the perfectly arranged tables. The maitre d' led them to a table in front of the windows, and they each ordered a glass of water. While they were waiting they perused the menu. After a moment, she closed her menu. Will you just order for me, please? He nodded and closed his menu as well. I'd be happy to. They each had chicken, a salad, and a potato. The food was good, but certainly not good enough for the prices they charged. Esther never wanted to eat there again. She was happier feeding her family for a week on the amount of money they spent on the one meal. Afterward, they walked back to the wagon, and he drove them to the mercantile. While he was talking to the shopkeeper to get the order for the community, she looked through the different fabrics. She found two that she liked for herself, and found some plain white linen for the baby's first clothes. She had found scraps at the homestead, and she would use them to sew another quilt for the baby before he arrived. She picked up a length of flannel for diapers and some thread and walked to the front. The money in her purse would be more than enough for what she needed. Thomas looked down at the small pile in front of her. Do you have enough? he asked in a whisper. I should. She checked the amount of cash she had, and it should be enough with a little bit left over. The doctor wasn't as expensive as I expected, he explained. You can get more if you need it. She smiled and rushed off to find a length of blue fabric. It would be perfect to make him some work shirts from. When she got back to the counter with the cloth for Thomas, he handed her a pencil and a piece of paper. For your letter to Mrs. Long. She smiled and gave him the money she had with her, before walking to the end of the counter to quickly write a letter to Harriet. She hoped her friend hadn't worried too much about her. Hopefully she'd understand how hard it was to mail something with as far out of town as they lived. Dear Harriet, I'm so sorry I forgot to write immediately. My morning sickness was horrible on the train, and it's been hectic since I got here. Thomas is a good man and I'm happy to be married to him. He treats me very well. I hope your marriage is as good as mine. I'll write when I have more time. I'm standing at the counter of the mercantile so I can mail this before I leave town. Best wishes, Esther. Esther folded the letter and quickly scrawled Harriet's address. She walked back to Thomas. Where is the post office? The shopkeeper looked up. You must be new around here. I'm the postmaster. Oh. She handed the man her letter, wishing there was a separate post office so she would feel more comfortable putting it in someone else's hands. What do I owe you? She handed him some change and turned to watch as Thomas picked up a large wooden box full of goods and walked to the wagon with it. She followed him out, 
got onto the seat by herself and waited for him to finish loading the wagon. She'd enjoyed the brief time shopping, but she was ready to go home and spend the day with her new husband. The trip went much faster than her first trip out to the homestead and she was thankful for that. When they arrived, she immediately began preparations for supper. When Thomas brought their supplies into the house, she looked at him. Do we need to deliver the goods to the others today? Or will we wait? He shook his head. I'd like to do it after supper if you feel up to it. I don't want to have to unload the wagon and then reload it tomorrow morning. She nodded. Okay. She'd planned to make pancakes for supper because they were quick and easy, but instead switched to bacon sandwiches, which were even quicker. She didn't want to be caught out on the road after dark living in such an uncivilized area. Once the meal was over, she followed him out to the wagon. Are you sure you feel up to going, he asked. He searched her face for any sign of tiredness. She sighed. Please don't start that again. I know the doctor told you I was the picture of health. He smiled and helped her into the buggy. He did. He thought about the other thing the doctor had told him as well. Knowing that women were more accepting of their husband's advances during their pregnancy made him smile. He'd test the doctor's theory once they were home that night. It was full dark by the time they pulled into the yard that night. Everyone had been thankful for their deliveries and every single woman had invited her in for tea and cookies. After the second house, she started smiling politely and shaking her head. Even with the extra hunger pregnancy brought on she couldn't eat that many cookies. It had been nice seeing the other women's homes. Samuel and Victoria lived in the largest house by far. The main part of the house was wood, but they'd had to use sod to add on over the years. It had given the house a very unique look. The other two houses were made from sod only. Esther was thankful for the wood house she lived in. She would have been thankful to have a sod roof over her head if it were the only option, but the wooden house felt far cleaner than the sod would have. She'd have had no idea how to clean a sod house. She was yawning when she walked into the house to ready herself for bed while Thomas unhitched the team and put them in their stalls for the night. They'd had a busy day. She rushed to change into her nightgown and climbed into bed. She was excited that Thomas would be willing to touch her again. It had seemed so strange to her that he was lying beside her in bed every night, but refusing to touch her, because he was afraid he may hurt her. She didn't want their relationship to hinge solely on sexual relations, but she knew they were important for their marriage to succeed. When she finally heard Thomas's footsteps on the stairs, her heart started beating a little faster. She needed to feel like she was loved and wanted by him. He opened the door slowly and stripped silently. Once he was settled on his pillow beside her, she rolled to him resting her head on his shoulder. His arms went around her and he stroked her back affectionately. After a moment he closed his eyes and fell asleep. She stared at him startled. What had just happened? They finally had permission from the doctor to make love and he fell asleep? She rolled to her side facing away from him and squeezed her eyes shut. She'd never felt so rejected in her life. What was wrong with her that her own husband wasn't interested in her? Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Thomas woke early the following morning and saw his beautiful wife's head on the pillow beside his in the pre-dawn light. He blinked a couple of times in surprise. Had he really fallen asleep without making love to her? He must have and now he wanted to kick himself for it. She'd made it clear that she was willing and he'd slept. It had been a long tiring day, but that was no excuse. He'd have to find some way to make it up to her. He got up and went down the stairs to milk the cows, frustrated with himself. Would he ever be the kind of husband his beautiful new wife needed? Esther woke alone and got out of bed, stumbling down the stairs to fix breakfast. If all her new husband wanted from her was to have a cook and cleaning woman, then she'd be the best cook and cleaning woman he'd ever seen. It certainly wasn't what she'd expected when she married him, but she'd do what needed to be done. She whipped up the batter for French toast, holding the bowl against her stomach. 
she fried bacon while she waited for him to come in the house, and as soon as he stepped foot inside, without meeting his eyes, she dipped the first pieces of bread. When she'd made a huge platter of toast, she sat down across from him and he prayed for them both. She was surprised to hear him pray for guidance in how to become a better husband. Why did he think he was lacking? After breakfast, he kissed her cheek, and she started work on the dishes, having a big day in front of her. She needed to bake fresh bread, and the laundry needed to be done. She usually did the laundry on Mondays, but because they were out it was all piled up and waiting for her. She wasn't looking forward to the day ahead, but she'd do it all with a smile. Today was one of those days she wished she had a friend close by she could talk to. She wished there was way to talk to Harriet and get an immediate answer, but she knew that was just a dream. If she hurried through her work, though, she might have time to write her friend a lengthy letter and ask for advice. By the time Thomas got home for lunch, all of the dirty clothes were on the line and she was taking the first of the loaves of bread out of the oven. Thomas took his place and she sat across from him at the table. He took her hand for the prayer and she bowed her head. While they ate, he talked about how well the wheat was doing. I think harvest is going to be early this year. When is early? She knew about corn farming, but nothing at all about wheat farming. She'd heard that many people in the area grew both, but Thomas and his friends only grew wheat. In a week or two. I really have wanted to try to grow winter wheat, but I've never harvested in time that I could have the fields ready for September planting. This year, with the early yield, I think I can do it. Esther wrinkled her brow. You'd grow wheat through the winter? He took a bite of his sandwich. Most of the farmers in Kansas who grow wheat grow winter wheat. The winter wheat is different, because you plant it in September and then it's dormant through the winter. Most of the rainfall we get in Kansas is through the winter and spring, which is better for the wheat to grow. So I want to start growing winter wheat. His eyes danced as he talked about it, which surprised Esther, because he was such a quiet man, she'd rarely seen him get excited about anything. Will that be enough time between crops? He shrugged. I have no idea, but we're going to find out. It would be wonderful if we could get two crops in this year. I've never done it before, but I'm sure I can do it. I've been planting earlier and earlier in the season every year hoping I'd be able to make the switch. She knew the work involved in two crops in a year, but she also knew it would be good for them financially. Is there anything I can do to help? He shook his head. You do plenty. Thomas stood and kissed the top of her head as he ran out the door. She could almost see the dollar signs dancing in his eyes, and she really didn't blame him. The more money they made this year, the easier things would be as they started their family. She worked hard that afternoon, getting the floors scrubbed and finishing up her work early so she could make a special dinner. She felt that she was little more than a cook for Thomas, so if that's all she could be for him, then she needed to be the best cook he'd ever known. She made a cake with whipped cream for frosting before making chicken and dumplings for dinner. Knowing they were his favorite she made them as often as she could. As she worked she thought about the situation and had decided she'd make no more advances toward her husband. If he was interested in having relations with her, he knew where she slept. She wasn't going to be rejected again. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Thomas hurried toward the house at the end of the day. He was running a little later than usual and knew that Esther would worry if he wasn't on time. He'd put in a long day, but he was excited to be able to spend time with his wife. If she hadn't been there he knew he wouldn't be in a hurry to go home. He thanked God for her every day. Rushing into the house, he found her putting dinner on the table. His mouth watered from the smells coming from the kitchen. Dinner smells wonderful. He rushed to the basin to wash his hands. I hope you're hungry, because I made a lot. He looked down at the chicken and dumplings in the bowl she placed in front of him. Did you kill the pullet yourself? She nodded, not looking at him. She'd wanted to surprise him with his favorite meal, and the only way she could was by taking care of the chicken herself. Her mother had done it all the time, so she'd watched, and it wasn't very hard. 
She put a plate of fresh bread and butter on the table and sat down across from him. I wanted to surprise you with your favorite meal. His eyes met hers and he grinned, taking her hand in his. Thank you. I want you to know how much I appreciate the little things you do for me. You really are a good wife. She nodded, filling up with sadness. She may be good at some of the parts of being a wife, but obviously she wasn't good at all of them. You're welcome. If he noted the sadness on her face, he didn't say anything about it. Instead he bowed his head and prayed, thanking God for their meal. He ate four full bowls of the chicken and dumplings and sat back patting his belly when he was done. That was wonderful. She stood and pulled the cake from the counter where she'd had it resting under a bowl so he wouldn't see it. It was a chocolate cake with whipped cream for frosting, and although she'd never used whipped cream for frosting, her mother had told her it was a great alternative when you didn't have enough sugar. She sliced the cake and took him a piece, grabbing a small one for herself. He stared at the cake for a minute with wide eyes and his face lit up with a smile. You're going to spoil me. She smiled. I think women should spoil their husbands. He picked up his fork and took a bite, closing his eyes as the sweetness of the cake exploded on his tongue. This is really good. She watched him eat a couple more bites before cutting into her own piece. She was surprised at how appreciative he was of everything she did and how much she enjoyed doing special things for him. I'm glad you like it. While she did the dishes, he sat at the table scribbling away at a piece of paper. What are you doing? she asked as she put away the last dry dish. I'm making myself a schedule for harvest and replanting time. I'll have to be fast and efficient if I'm going to make the winter wheat work this year. If I harvest in early August, I only have until the beginning of September to prepare the fields. And I'll need to get the winter wheat seed. He tapped the pencil on the side of the table. I really do think I can make the transition this year. She stifled a yawn, but sat down across from him. Will the neighbors help? He shook his head. They're all doing the same thing I am. We talked about it on Sunday, and all of us feel like this is the year to do it. We had an early spring, so the crops were in the ground early, and they're strong healthy crops that grew quickly because of the added rainfall this year. I'll help however I can. You'll help by cooking meals and taking care of our baby. He sighed and pushed the paper away. I can do it, but just barely. I have one dormant field that I'll start readying tomorrow. Why did you leave a field dormant? She'd never heard of a farmer doing such a thing. I decided in the spring that I'd do at least that small field with the winter wheat this year. I was hoping to do them all, but I figured if I couldn't, at least the one field would be a good trial run. He smiled and stretched. I hope you're ready for a hectic month or two. She shrugged. I'm a farmer's wife. Harvest and planting are the most important times of year. She stood up. I'm going up to get ready for bed. I'm tired. He watched her go up the stairs and decided he'd give her five minutes before he followed. He was looking forward to going to bed with his wife. He watched the clock and when he felt like he'd given her enough time, he climbed the stairs after her. He pushed open the bedroom door and saw her curled up on her side facing away from the middle of the bed. He blew out the lantern and stripped in the dark, joining her between the sheets. She didn't turn toward him as she usually did, so he wasn't sure what to do. Was she asleep? Was she no longer interested in his attentions? He lay there for a moment staring at her silhouette in the darkness before rolling to his back with a heavy sigh. If she didn't want him touching her, he could certainly understand that. He lay in the dark staring at the ceiling for a while before he fell asleep. Had he ruined his chances for a normal marriage with his fears? Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Esther lay in the dark staring at the wall, wishing Thomas would reach out a hand to touch her, but not willing to turn to him for fear of rejection. Why would he want to touch a woman who was carrying another man's baby anyway? She'd made a mess of things, she knew, and she wished she knew how to fix it. Maybe after the baby was born he'd want to touch her again. 
A single tear dripped off the side of her nose and onto the pillow, the only visible sign of how alone she felt. That day set a routine for the days to come. Thomas worked later and later every night trying to get ready for the harvest and replanting. Doing both so close together was risky, but he was certain he was going to be able to make it work. Esther spent every day cooking, cleaning and sewing tiny little things for the new baby. She cut the flannel she'd purchased to make diapers, and made another quilt. The harvest brought a much higher rate than was expected, and Thomas bought the wood for a cradle, and Esther was able to purchase more fabric to make curtains and a matching tablecloth. She was excited to be able to put her own mark on the house, feeling more like it was her home by doing so. Thomas and the other three men in their congregation took turns when it was time for planting. They went to Samuel's farm first and the four of them worked together from sunup to sundown for three days to get the planting done. The women spent the day together working to fix their meals, and they helped Victoria with the fall cleaning while they were there. They moved through the four houses of the church members and got everything done as quickly and efficiently as they could. Thomas and Esther's farm came last, and Esther enjoyed playing hostess to all the others. She'd done her fall cleaning early so that the tired women would be able to sit and sew together instead of doing all the work of cleaning another house. You shouldn't have done it without us, Victoria protested when she realized what her sister-in-law had done. Esther shrugged. I wanted us to be able to enjoy our time, and it's more fun to sew tiny clothes for a baby than it is to clean house. The other women laughed at her reasoning, but they happily settled down at the table with their needles and thread and hemmed diapers and made tiny little outfits. The older boys all helped to plant, and the older girls watched the younger children so the women could work together. It was a system that the group had perfected over their years of living together and it worked well. Once the planting was done, they were all exhausted. Esther worried about Thomas, because he looked so drawn, but he was smiling from ear to ear, thrilled to have finally made the switch to winter wheat. Esther rubbed his shoulders for him. Do you think the switch will work well for us? Absolutely. Most farmers in the country have fresh wheat in the fall, not the spring. We'll be harvesting when the wheat is needed the most. It should mean more money in our pockets. Esther smiled down at him, thrilled by his excitement. I'm glad you were finally able to do it this year. Now instead of working on growing in the summer, I'll be working on preparing the fields for the next crop. I am a little worried about low yield this year, because of growing two crops so close together. Esther finished rubbing his shoulders and stepped back. She knew her belly had been pressing into his back while she'd rubbed them and that made her uncomfortable, but she was getting so big it was hard to prevent. Is that better? He nodded, turning to take her hand in his. Thank you. Esther still wasn't quite sure where she stood with her husband. He was gentle and loving, but he never made any type of moves toward having an active sex life with her. It was as if he was content to just hold hands and kiss her on occasion. She wasn't sure if she was pleased that he was giving her time to adjust to him or going insane because she wanted more from her marriage than he was giving her. It was my pleasure. And it had been. She enjoyed touching her husband, and digging her fingers into his muscled shoulders hadn't been a hardship for her. He used the hand he was holding to pull her onto his lap and he rested his head on her shoulder. I'm going to start building the cradle tomorrow. It should only take a day or two. She looked at him startled. We're not in a hurry. Why don't you wait until the crop is dormant for the winter, and then we'll worry about the cradle. He shook his head. I want to make sure it's done in good time. I'm not going to complain if you make it early, she told him with a grin. But I'm not worried about it not being done in time. I have another four months to go. It sounds like a long time, but it'll be here before we know it. I can't wait to hold him. Esther laughed. Have you decided it's a boy, then? He shrugged. I have no idea. I'd be happy with either one. Thomas was struck by how pretty his wife was again. She'd gained back most of the weight she'd lost during her morning sickness phase and her cheeks were fuller. Everything was fuller. 
Her stomach was getting huge, but he didn't dare comment on that. He rested his hand against her stomach for the first time, and she looked at him, wondering what he was doing. He moved his hand over the firm mound, surprised by how hard it was. It feels odd. She smiled and nodded. Imagine how it feels when he starts moving in there. His eyes grew wide and he looked at her. That happens? All the time. Is it happening now? She shook her head. Not right this minute. She was surprised by his interest. Do you want me to let you know when it does happen? He thought about that for a minute. I don't want you chasing me down on the farm to tell me, but if I'm home, yes. Would I be able to feel it from the outside? I think so. I haven't tried. I feel it so strongly you'd have to be able to feel it. He grinned looking down at her stomach and stroking it again. He really wanted to move her dress out of the way, so he could see her bare stomach and see what changes the child had wrought, but he didn't feel he had a right to do that. Of course, if she removed her dress, he wouldn't be as interested in the way the baby had changed her as he was in her body. He felt himself harden and moved her a little away from him so she wouldn't feel it. He didn't want her to feel obligated to have relations with him if she wasn't interested. Esther felt the involuntary movement against her hip and turned to him startled. Did he want her after all? She leaned toward him and placed her lips against his, her tongue moving to trace his lips. If he rejected her, she knew it would devastate her, so she held her breath while she waited to see how he'd respond. His arms went fully around her and he deepened the kiss, his tongue moving inside her mouth to move with hers. He pulled her more fully against him, wishing they were upstairs instead of sitting at the kitchen table. She sank against his body, touching his shoulders and moving against him, getting as close as she could. She was startled when he stood and swept her into his arms carrying her up the stairs. Did this mean he was interested in her as a woman after all? When they reached their bedroom, Thomas set her on her feet. The room was already dark and he quickly unbuttoned her dress and pushed it down her body. He wasn't going to give her the chance to change her mind. She stood still as he removed her dress and then her petticoats. His hands roamed all over her body in the darkness. When she felt his hand against her bare stomach, she was afraid he'd shy away, unwilling to be intimate with a woman who was so far along in her pregnancy, but he explored her all over. He pushed her back against the edge of the bed, and she fell backward onto it. He followed her down, pressing kisses to her neck and shoulders, his hands roaming up and down her body. She was finally willing to be touched by him and he wasn't going to let her go. She wrapped her arms around his neck and kissed him, her hands caressing the shoulders she'd just finished massaging. She wanted his clothes off, but was too worried he'd back away if she tried to remove them. After a minute he stood and quickly stripped in the darkness. The moon shone through the open window, and the gentle breeze cooled the room. Once he was completely naked, he dropped down beside her on the bed, kissing her frantically. Her hands went to his body as if of their own accord, stroking everything she could reach. She rubbed his bare back and his shoulders, moaning softly as his fingers caressed her tender breasts. He hoped she was ready, because he couldn't hold out much longer against the onslaught of feelings rushing through him for his beautiful bride. He needed to be inside her. He carefully rolled atop her, afraid he would squash her, but not knowing of another way to accomplish what he wanted to do. Is this okay? he asked. Oh, yes. She spread her legs wide for him, loving the feel of him moving between them and positioning himself at her opening. He pressed carefully inside her, watching her face for any signs of discomfort. When he saw none, he began moving, quickly with strong, deep strokes. Her arms wrapped around him, caressing him from shoulders to buttocks as he moved within her. The guilt she'd felt as she'd lain beneath him the first time was completely gone, and she was able to fully enjoy her husband's movements inside her. Within moments, she felt her body starting to build toward its peak, clenching around him. She let out a gasp of pleasure, clutching him to her. Thomas watched her face as she reached her pleasure, and it struck him that she was more beautiful in that moment than she had ever been to him.
He quickened his pace and followed her just moments later, collapsing to her side, still worried he'd hurt the baby. He lay panting beside her, but pulled her into his arms to hold her tightly. I've wanted to do that for so long. She stared at him in disbelief. I didn't think you were interested anymore, or I'd have insisted. Are you serious? Of course I was interested. She sputtered. But, but, you didn't want to until we talked to the doctor, and then when he said it was okay, you got into bed and fell asleep. She leaned on her elbow as she argued with him. He sighed. I know. And I felt like a heel for it. I wasn't able to sleep all night the night before because I was worried about what the doctor would say, and then we drove all day, and then we had to deliver all of everyone's things they asked for from the city. By the time we got back, I was exhausted. I didn't mean to fall asleep. She dropped her head to his shoulder. All this time I've been worried that you didn't see me as a woman because you didn't make love to me that night. I'm so sorry. After that you stopped trying to get close to me so I didn't think you were interested anymore and I didn't want to feel like I was forcing you. She laughed softly. So we've both been tiptoeing around each other, wanting to make love, but afraid to say anything about it? Let's not be afraid anymore, Thomas. Let's make love when we want to. Thomas hugged her closer to him. Oh, I want to. She grinned against his shoulder, her eyelids drooping. Good. Keep that attitude. He kissed the top of her head before closing his eyes. Being married to a beautiful pregnant woman wasn't a hardship after all. Chapter 8 When Esther woke the following morning it was still dark out. At first she couldn't figure out what had awakened her, but then she felt Thomas's tongue against her neck. Have I mentioned you're beautiful in the mornings? She laughed. I'm not beautiful. I'm round. I'm very round. He grinned. You're getting round, there's no doubt, but still, you're beautiful in every way. She smiled and stroked his hair away from his face, noting how long it had gotten. It's time for me to cut your hair. It was time a long time ago, but with the harvest and replanting, there just hasn't been time. He snuggled closer against her, pulling her body fully against his. There's time today. I'll cut it after breakfast. He smiled. I'd like that. He loved the idea of her fingers in his hair as she cut off the excess length. Any way she touched him brought him peace. Well, any way she touched him brought him pleasure. There were some ways that didn't bring him any peace at all. I love just lying in bed with you in the morning. It's my favorite time of day. Really? I never realized. He stroked his hand down her arm and glared out the window where the sun was starting to rise. I wish we could just spend the whole day in bed together. She smiled. I'd like that, too, but the cows aren't going to milk themselves. And no one would cook for us if we decided to be lazy all day. He laughed. I wasn't thinking about being lazy at all. His hand stroked up and down her arm, and he pulled her against him, pressing his lips to hers. After a moment he groaned and rolled to his back. The cows won't milk themselves. Someday, someone is going to invent a machine to milk cows, and then I won't have to go through this every morning. She laughed. That would be something, wouldn't it? She stood with her back to him and pulled on her dress, running a brush through her hair before pinning it on top of her head. She felt a little bubble of joy inside her, knowing that her husband cared about her. Maybe he didn't love her yet, but she felt certain that he would someday. She rushed down the stairs and started a fire in the stove, ready to fix breakfast for the man she loved. Was that right? How could she love a man she'd only known for a few months? She'd only married him to avoid a bad situation at home. It couldn't be real love. Could it? She mixed the scrambled eggs with more vigor than usual flinging a bit of yolk across the kitchen. How could she love Thomas when she was still in love with Charlie? And if she did love Thomas, did that mean she was betraying Charlie? 
Thomas had been a good husband to her, and she was certain he'd be a good father to the baby she carried, but did that mean, well, what did it mean? She sank down on a chair and slowly finished beating the eggs. Did she need to analyze things so much? Sure, she still loved Charlie. She'd always love him. They'd shared their first kiss under the tree in the schoolyard. He was the first man to ever hold her hand. She'd never forget the look on his face when he dropped to one knee in her father's farmyard and offered her a ring. How could she stop loving Charlie? But Thomas, he was as different from Charlie as night from day. Charlie had been muscular with blonde hair and blue eyes. Charlie had been slightly cocky, so sure of himself it had always made Esther a bit crazy. Thomas was just the opposite. He was shy and sweet. He would never assume anything about anyone. He treated Esther as if she were made of glass, at least he had until last night. Esther blushed as she remembered the passion she'd shared with Thomas. He'd been so eager to make love with her, but he'd been gentle and loving at the same time. Charlie had never been afraid to push her over and pounce on her in a way that she knew Thomas probably never would. How could one woman love two men who were such total opposites? Did she have the same kind of love for Thomas that she'd had for Charlie? Or did her love stem from the fact that he was so good to her, helping her in every way? Did she love him for what he did instead of who he was? She poured the eggs into the pan and tried to bring Charlie's face into her mind. She could still see him, but his features weren't as sharp. Had she only loved Charlie because he was handsome? No, that wasn't the case at all. She'd loved him for him, but still. How could she love another man so soon after his death? When Thomas came in from milking, he sat at the table like he always did, and when Esther turned to look at him she smiled automatically. Had he gotten better looking overnight? Or was she seeing him through love? She didn't know which it was, but he was definitely more attractive to her. She put his plate on the table in front of him, and on impulse leaned down to kiss his cheek. He grinned up at her. What was that for? She shrugged, embarrassed. Your cheek just looked lonely. She walked around the table and took her place across from him. He smiled and took her hand in his, bowing his head for their morning prayer. When he'd said amen, he looked up, still holding her hand and began eating. She took a bite of her toast, unable to take her eyes off him. I'm going to work on the cradle today. I have a bit of stain left from when I made the rocking chairs. Do you want the cradle stained or natural wood? Or I have some white paint I could use as well? She tilted her head to the side for a moment, considering. I'd like it to be white if it's not too much trouble. He shook his head. It's no trouble at all. He forked up a bite of eggs, his eyes staring into hers. Thank you for last night. She blushed. I enjoyed it, too. She looked down at her plate, unsure what to say to him beyond that. He brought the hand he still held to his lips. I hope that means you'll be ready for a break at lunchtime to take a nap. She laughed, her eyes meeting his. I don't know. I have to do laundry today, and it's a terribly interesting chore. I'll have to do my best to persuade you then. After breakfast, he headed out to the barn to work on building the cradle. She had the clean wash on the clothesline and fresh bread baked by the time he came in for lunch. She glanced over her shoulder as she finished frying up bacon for sandwiches. How's the cradle coming along? Good. I think it's going to be the best cradle I've ever built. Her eyes lit up. That's wonderful. How many have you built? She put his plate in front of him and sat down. Just this one. She sighed. You really do think you're funny, don't you? He winked at her before bowing his head for their prayer. After lunch, I'll take you out to see it if you'd like. I'd like that a lot. Well, if it's more than just a few pieces of wood I would like it. Is it just a pile of wood? He shrugged. It's a pile of wood that's cut to the specifications needed for a cradle. 
I'll put it all together this afternoon. So if I go out to the barn with you after lunch, I'm just going to see a pile of wood pieces? He nodded. Pretty much. She shook her head. What's gotten into you today? You're like a different person. He grinned. I'm happy. The future is looking up. I just planted my second wheat crop of the year, and my wife likes it when I touch her. Life is good. She laughed. Your wife has always liked it when you touched her. You just wouldn't do it. He put the last bite of his second sandwich in his mouth, stood up and grabbed her hand, dragging her toward the stairs. Really? I promise, I'll never stop now. She giggled all the way up the stairs. She stopped giggling when he started undressing her. We can't do this in the middle of the day. She swatted his hands away with embarrassment. He laughed. We live in the middle of nowhere. All of our friends are working on their crops. What's to stop us? He had her undressed and under him on the bed before she could figure out how to protest. Once he'd started kissing her, she had no desire to protest. Esther was taking the clothes off the line just before dinner time when a man on horseback rode up to the house. She shielded her eyes against the bright afternoon sunshine to see who it was. Samuel. She blushed, thinking how glad she was he hadn't ridden up a few hours before. Thomas came out of the barn and went to greet his brother, who handed him something, waved at Esther, and rode off. Thomas spent a moment staring at the paper and walked to her, his face revealing nothing. Telegram for you. Esther held out her hand. He put the telegram into it and she read it, her face lighting up with excitement. I will be arriving on the noon train in Lindsborg on October 1st stop I would love to be able to see you stop I will stay for two days stop please meet me stop. Esther's eyes danced as they met Thomas's. Can she stay here? Please? Thomas agreed immediately. I'd like to meet your friend. He made a face, thinking about the date. The first is tomorrow. I wish she'd given us more notice. Esther looked at the date on the telegram. The telegram was dated September 18th. No one has been to town because of planting. He nodded. You're right. We'll drive into town tomorrow morning to be there when she arrives. Esther threw her arms around Thomas and hugged him tightly. I can make the drive myself if I need to. She didn't want to drive that far by herself, but she would to see her friend. She knew Thomas had a lot to do with the crops just planted. He shook his head. I'm not letting my very pregnant wife drive three hours each way through the wilderness alone. He thought for a moment. Samuel went into town today, so there's no need to ask the others if they need anything. Do you want to eat at the restaurant while we're in town? She shook her head automatically. I'll make some fried chicken and we can have a picnic on the way home. She rushed toward the house. Do you mind butchering one of the chickens for me? Not at all. She hurried to the stove to cook dinner. She wanted to make a cake to serve the following night for her friend, and knew she needed to start the chicken tonight if she was going to get it done before they left. She made a simple meal of sandwiches again so she could start the cake. When Thomas came in and saw what she'd fixed, he grinned. Looks like I'll get good dinners for a couple of days while your friend is here. She turned to him and waved a spoon covered with cake batter at him. You'll eat what I fix. I cook good meals for you every night. You can put up with sandwiches one night. He sighed. But I get sandwiches for lunch every day. She raised an eyebrow. Are you ready to go back to cooking for yourself? No, ma'am. I'm grateful for the sandwich, ma'am. She laughed as she poured the batter into a pan and put it into the oven then rushed to sit across from him. I need to change the sheets in the nursery. He made a face. Didn't you change them after Marianne stayed with us? Yes, but I want them fresh smelling for Harriet. He sighed. 
After dinner I'll bring the clothes in from the line for you so you don't have to worry about losing any time making everything perfect for Harriet. You really don't mind that she's coming to visit? How could I mind when it makes you this happy? Asterisk asterisk asterisk. The train station was busy the next day as they stood waiting for the train to come in. Esther was practically bouncing up and down with her excitement. Thomas laughed and put his arm across her shoulders. You won't get her here any faster by jumping around. And you're going to scramble that baby's brains. Esther laughed at herself and forced her body to remain still. She could see the train in the distance, but it was just moving too slowly. She's almost here. Thomas nodded, loving the look of excitement on her face. She was more beautiful than ever. When everyone filed off the train and moved to the platform, Esther scanned the crowd, finally squealing, there she is. I see her. She grabbed Thomas's hand and dragged him toward the platform and her friend. When she got to Harriet, she stopped in front of her and pulled her into a tight hug. It's so good to see you. Harriet laughed, hugging her back. I got delayed leaving Beckham for my wedding and am on my way to Washington now. I decided I had to stop and see you since I had to travel close to here anyway. She didn't add that she'd have to change trains three times to make the stop work for her, but she didn't have to. Seeing the happiness on Esther's face was enough. How much luggage do you have? Thomas asked politely. Esther blushed. I guess I should introduce my husband. Thomas, this is my dear friend Harriet. Harriet, this is my husband, Thomas Wilson. Thomas tipped the straw hat on his head. It's nice to meet you Mrs. Long. Please, call me Harriet. She looked over at the back of the train and saw they had finished unloading the luggage. I have three trunks. I'm sorry to have to ask you to take it all to the hotel for me. Esther shook her head. Hotel? There's no way my friend is staying in a hotel. You're coming back to the homestead with us. Harriet smiled and nodded. I'd like to see where you live. Esther linked her arm through her friends and led her to the wagon. Sorry it's not a pretty carriage, but it's all we have. Suddenly she was a bit embarrassed by their lack of material possessions. Harriet had lived in a big beautiful house and had servants to do her every whim. How would she feel about staying in a small house in the middle of Kansas? No need to apologize. I don't care where I am as long as I'm with my friend. Esther moved to the middle of the seat and Harriet climbed in beside her. You're getting so big. Esther smiled and patted her belly. If anyone else had said that to her, she'd have been embarrassed, but it was Harriet, and she knew Harriet didn't mean it badly. I am. She grinned at her friend. We had a scare a while back. Harriet shook her head. What happened? You're okay, now. Esther nodded. She explained what had happened when she couldn't find Thomas in the field she'd expected him to be working in. I felt like such an idiot later, but I still get so scared if I don't know exactly where he's working. He's been known to draw me a map before he leaves so I'll be able to walk right to him if I want to find him for anything. Harriet hugged her friend. I'm sorry it's been so hard for you. She patted Esther's stomach. You've gained back all the weight you lost when you were so sick and you look like you're truly happy. Esther nodded. I am. I've been married to two good men in my life. I don't know many women who can say that. Harriet shook her head. I don't either. I'm glad you found love. Esther blushed. Am I that obvious? I only realized I loved him yesterday morning. Harriet laughed. You're obvious to me. Of course, when I met you your grief was so bad I wanted to wrap you up in cotton. Kansas agrees with you. I love it here. Thomas's brother and sister-in-law are close and we have two other families who are there if we need them. It's a wonderful place for me to be. I'm so happy for you. When are you getting married? Harriet shrugged. 
I was supposed to be there two months ago, but Higgins was too sick to travel and I'm not going into a new marriage without taking him along. Esther frowned. You could find another butler there, couldn't you? Not one who is as loyal as Higgins. Is he okay, now? Harriet nodded. He is. And my new husband is waiting for me. He wrote back that he'd wait, but not to take forever. I think he was really annoyed that I wouldn't leave without my butler, but he'll live. Esther looked around. Where is Higgins? He left before me. He wanted to have a week to learn the Seattle area before I joined him there. Harriet smiled as Thomas climbed onto the seat beside Esther. He's very protective of you. Yes, he is. Esther waited for Harriet to say more, but when she didn't, Esther asked, Are you hungry? I made a picnic for us for the way home. Harriet smiled. That sounds wonderful. After sandwiches for four days on the train, I'll be thrilled to have a home-cooked meal. We'll stop once we're out of town, then. There's a nice little spot with trees where I vomited right after Thomas and I married. Esther grinned at the look on Harriet's face. You wrote the trip here was bad for your morning sickness. That's over now? Thank God. I don't think I'd have lived through another month of that nonsense. Thomas looked around Esther to add, she was skin and bones when she got here. I wasn't sure she'd make it through the night. Esther shrugged. It was over the day after I arrived. I was so happy to suddenly have my appetite back. She grinned. I thought Thomas was going to fall over when I started out eating him at every meal. He thought I had the appetite of a bird when I first arrived. Harriet laughed enjoying the happiness she could see on her friend's face. She hoped when she had the same luck when she reached Washington. By the time they'd arrived at the homestead, all of Harriet's fears for her friend had been allayed. She watched as Thomas lifted her down from the wagon and saw the look of love on his face and knew she'd done a very good job with the two of them. She hoped they were still as happy when she dropped the bomb she had to give them. After dinner that evening, when they were all sitting around talking, Harriet brought up the primary reason for her visit. Yes, she'd been concerned about Esther and had wanted to see with her own eyes that her friend was getting along well, but she had bad news to give her. Your mother was talking to a friend of hers about how excited she was about the baby you're carrying, and how she was disappointed that she'd probably never get to see the baby because you were living in Kansas now. Esther nodded. She knew her mother was extremely excited about the baby. It was her first grandchild, so it was to be expected. She wrote her mother every week. I'm glad she's excited. Well, they were talking about it in the mercantile, and they didn't see who was standing behind them. Esther felt her heart drop into her stomach. Mrs. Perry? Harriet nodded. She demanded to know where in Kansas you were. Your mother just said, in the wilderness somewhere and now she's trying to find me. I'm worried that's the case. Your mother told me because she wanted you to know. I thought it would be easier if you found out in person. Harriet squeezed her friend's hand. I'm sorry to have to tell you. Does she know the baby is Charlie's? Harriet shrugged. I don't know. I think she's assumed that it is. She's been asking all of your old friends about you, trying to find out where you are. She's been to your parents' house a dozen times trying to pry information out of your mother and your younger siblings. Esther's hands covered the mound that her child made in her stomach. She's not taking my baby. Thomas, who had been sitting at the table cleaning his rifle and pretending not to notice the conversation going on around him, looked up. The old witch is not getting her hands on our child. The words were spoken softly, but vehemently. If he drew breath, she would not take their child. Harriet looked at him in surprise, thrilled to see that he thought of the baby as his own already. It's better that you know so you can be prepared. Thomas nodded. When I'm working away from the house, you'll need to spend your days with Victoria. Esther sighed. I can't do the work I need to do at Victoria's house. 
Thomas made a face. How about if you spend one day working at her house with her, and she spends the next here with you? That way you both get all your work done, because you have double the hands every day. Esther knew there was no arguing with him. She didn't care to fight in front of Harriet. She would rather learn to use a rifle and defend herself, but she didn't dare say so right then. She turned back to Harriet. Thanks for letting us know. Harriet nodded. It's part of the reason I came to see you. I didn't want to tell you in a letter. She stood and yawned discreetly. I think I'm going to make my way upstairs for the night. She smiled at Esther. I assume we'll be eating breakfast before the rooster crows? Esther nodded with a grin. Of course. You're staying in the country, Harriet. I'll be happy to return to the city and my sleeping late. She turned and headed up the stairs, and Esther waited to talk until she could hear the door of the nursery close from upstairs. I want you to teach me to use a rifle so I can protect myself and the baby. I don't want to have to spend all my days with Victoria. She liked her sister-in-law, but she didn't need to be with her every single day. Thomas shook his head. I don't want you shooting in your condition. It wouldn't be good for you. I need to be able to protect myself. No, you don't. It's my job to protect you. Thomas crossed his arms over his chest, making it clear he wasn't backing down. But you're going to send me to your brothers so your sister-in-law can protect me. How is that right? He sighed. I just want you safe, and I don't want you risking the baby by shooting. How about a handgun? Could you teach me to shoot a handgun? Would that be better? He studied her. You're not going to go to Victoria's, are you? She shook her head. I have to be able to be independent. Once the baby is here, I can't be going back and forth every day. It'll be too cold. Marianne could come and stay again. Esther glared at Thomas. Marianne is ten years old. There's no way I'm going to let her learn to shoot a gun to protect me. It's not happening. Thomas sighed. He knew she was right, but he hated the idea. Okay. As soon as Harriet is on her way, I'll teach you to shoot a handgun. No rifles, though. I don't care what I learn to shoot. I really don't. Just so I can protect my baby. He stood up and put his rifle back on the wall where it belonged. He'd keep his rifle with him at all times now, knowing that someone could be coming at any time for her. Are you ready for bed? She nodded and they climbed the stairs together, clinging to each other in the dark. She was afraid, but thanks to Harriet, she knew danger was coming and she would be ready for it. She fell asleep wrapped in her husband's arms, not realizing he'd spend the night lying awake staring at the ceiling.